All right. Well, we're going to jump right into the, the meat of the matter. If you uh, have your syllabus that I emailed you all, go ahead and um, access that. And Maddie, I emailed uh, your mom the, the printout. So just so you know, that's, you do have it. Awesome. Look at this. Take example, you, uh, you adults. This is how you organize. This is how you do it. Okay. So let's all uh, mute our channels now so I don't have to hear your wonderful um, outdoor life, Bill. The bears and pumas in the distance. Good. Awesome. Okay, so I'd like to start by addressing the chart. It's like the third page in, and it's what I call the songwriting quadrant. And I'm going to do a quick screen share as we, as we unpack this for a second. Um, and the, the really fun thing about this is it shows you that songwriting is literally four different arts rolled into one. And the reason I want to discuss this is because some people freak out when I mention that and they say, well, I can only do this or only do that. Um, the magic of this approach is you don't have to know all four to be an excellent singer songwriter. OK, <clears throat> a lot of my students, especially um, younger people, uh, start as singers and they are tired of singing cover songs. So they want to write their own material. Um, most of us are probably lyric writers. We pen a, a scrap of dog girl here or there or rhyme on a napkin or even a poem or a letter. You know, prose counts. Um, so most of us are probably going to relate to the lyric quadrant. Um, instrument on the lower left. A lot of people, just like most of my students here, play an instrument, a musical instrument or a banjo, and that will lead to little riffs and chords that can turn into a song. It's as simple as finding something you like. What if you like a G to A minor to D? And you're like, you just been sitting around in your backyard like all of us and doing this and go I really want this to become a song <laughs> if that's you then we have some answers coming up for you and finally on the lower right for nerds like me music theory is often where we approach songwriting with like chords that go together and how to create hooks from different scales and such so this class will be grouped into these four categories and just be aware that number one you don't have to be good at any more than one of these to be a singer songwriter and number two you can learn any of the other elements on the quadrant so that it's good news you don't have to be super talented to do any of this okay first of all i like to discuss what songwriting can do for you this is a great time to have some means of self-expression um one a self-expression through poems and lyrics and the funny thing is whether it's like a bad experience or a story you want to tell about someone or just an opinion you have um, as opposed to just voicing it on Facebook, we can now make it rhyme and put chords to it. Uh, humor is a great s subject for songwriting. The, the late, great John Prine would be a great example of taking mm -hmm. sort of intense and painful experiences and stories and putting just enough humor in there to make it palatable. So we'll discuss that more as we get into the poem section of this class. Um, also, what songwriting can do for you, it can actually help you improve your voice. For example, I'm a folk singer. I don't really sing. I just yell at you and make it rhyme. That's so. I, and for example, Dylan, okay, didn't really have a voice to sing, by, but his lyrics are so amazing that it didn't matter. Okay, um, songwriting will also encourage you to learn your instrument better because it'll give you ideas for different styles to learn. If you're a strummer, maybe you'll want a finger pick. Okay, learning different styles. It'll also be a great gateway to learn useful mu music theory. Notice I say useful, not like memorizing all the intervals, but more like what chords go together, chord families. We will discuss that in a bit. So it's four arts in one. This is the whole magic of being a songwriter. You're combining four different arts. Let's start with the first quadrant because most people are freaked out about this quadrant and that's the, the voice, okay? Because even good singers that I coach say they can't sing. This is so typical. Um, so the trick with this is to know that we have to dispel the mystique, the, the, the myth of being a good singer. If you're in opera, go for it, you know, break glasses and have a great vibrato. If you're a folk song writer, all you have to do is be somewhat coherent and rhyme. Okay. There's a whole style of singing in folk music known as the talking blues. And in fact, Woody Guthrie used to do this. And, and Arlo too, his son. And basically this predated modern hip hop rappers. 
they were doing the same thing, but sort of talking over their guitar. So if you're gonna do like, um, um, let's say, will the circle be unbroken? Here's how you would do it as a talking blues. Will that circle be unbroken in the sky, Lord, in the sky? There's a whole group of people that do that. And so you can actually talk your rhymes along with your instrument and even just have one or two chords. So I'm trying to show you that that idea that you have to be able to sing, to be a singer songwriter is completely false and it's also toxic and it keeps people from playing in this genre. So we're gonna throw that out the window. Then we have uh, under item two, uh, number two, uh, number one, I have message and personal style over sounding really good at perfection. So rather than wondering if you can carry a perfect tune with your voice, <coughs> think about your sound is your style. If you and I both pick up a guitar and make a G chord, we're gonna sound the same. If you and I both sing happy birthday, we're gonna sound extremely different. You're gonna sound like you, and I'm gonna sound like me. That's a gold mine. Just know that your own sound is already your personal style. You don't have to perfect it. Also, your message. Once you write a couple songs, you'll start to notice that there's certain things you like writing about, okay? And that will become your message over time. I like writing about people in a funny way. Well, I think it's funny, they may not. Uh, so that's sort of my message. And I put a link actually under on the Jam Along Facebook page. If you're not a member there, you should be. And I put a link to me doing one of these um, social distant online songwriter things recently. And I listened back and I couldn't stand my voice. But I could tell that I had a message and I could tell that I probably made a couple of people laugh. So that's the important thing is we're conveying our message, okay? Then under two, um, section subsection two, we have we talked about sing-songing. I call that sing-song, and that's a typo. It should say sing-song. Um, for example, Bob Dylan, he pretty much invented and popularized singing almost in key, but having every note curve off at the end. And that's a style. It's like a, it's like a poet orating. He was more orating than he was singing. And it works. It totally works. Um, now, you're not necessarily one to be quarantined with someone who does that all the time, but in a more open environment, it, it really works. Also, if any of you don't have your channel muted, please mute it because I can hear some background noise. Thank you. Um, we talked about the talking blues tradition. Toward the end of this class, I'm going to do a playful assignment. We're all going to try to write some kind of rhyme. And then when I meet you all at my next lesson, I'm going to put some music to it and show you how you can talk that rhyme over guitar chords. And it'll blow you away. It'll sound really amazing. Okay. Then we call uh, section two under the Roman numeral three, tune in a bucket, carrying a tune in a bucket. This is when I teach voice classes, and I actually do sometimes, <laughs> I say the main thing that you want to develop, if you want to develop your voice, is how to match a note, okay? This is something all of you can do. If you already sing a lot, ignore this section of the class, but basically, if you can match a note, then you'll develop your pitch. Because the voice is like a slide whistle. It doesn't have frets. If it did, it would be a lot easier to sing scales and match notes. So all you're gonna do in the comfort of your home and hopefully in the privacy of your room is play a, a note, okay? And you can say la, you can say na, you can say any letter you want, but you have to match that note. And then you'll go to two notes. And you'll check your voice with your instrument of choice, that rhymed, and that will make sure that you are in key with the, the song that you're gonna write. So I know there's people out there that are gonna watch this on YouTube and probably send me furious emails because they're trained vocal instructors and say, why did you not discuss projection in the diaphragm? And blah, 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 blah. Because I'm a banjo player, first of all, and second of all, I don't want to teach people how to classically sing. I just want them to convey their message in the most comfortable means possible. So. The first part of this class, I just really want to dispel the notion that you have to sing well to do this art of songwriting. It's very important to understand that. Songwriters do not have to be singers. That's our mantra. So let's look at item three. This is the uh, second corner of the quadrant, and that's lyrics. This is probably the most important section of the class because most of you will be able to enter the art of singing songwriting through the lyric portal. Um, and that's because most of us can rhyme with cat and most of us can create simple, silly rhymes. 
One of the underlying themes here is keep it silly. The instant we try to get too pompous and serious with our poems, the harder it becomes. So let's look under the section three. I call it cat and hat. Rhyming is the only essential skill for this, okay? There's different styles of rhyme, but the most common are AABB um, and ABAB. And that doesn't refer to the band ABBA, Joshua. I know they're your favorite. And so basically what you're going to be doing is, when we're done here, testing out your ability to pick two sentences that rhyme and then pick four sentences that each other line rhymes. This is, take a note of that. This is a good exercise for y'all. So the first ABAB, -A -B, sorry, AABB -A is the simplest. It is just like, um, well, I went walking my dog and then he went dookie on the neighbor's log. It's just, you're just gonna be, it's very, very easy to do that. The slightly more challenging is the ABAB -A -B, and I personally like to write in that style. Well, I went walking my dog on the log and I had to turn sprinkler on that's a B a B okay so that's a little more sophisticated but really everything out there is variants of those two any poem any lyric is going to be a variation of that for example some people like to go a a a B Dylan did that a lot I like that form where you'll go um when walk in I'm gonna beat this up to death here when walk in my dog you went to get on the log then I got lost in the fog but I got home anyway. And the next line will go cat, hat, bat, say. So see now the A-A-A-B will rhyme up. And that's a little more sophisticated, not quite bluegrass and folk, more like a pop music does that, okay? So the first exercise y'all can be doing after this class is just make up some silly rhymes. Rhyming is where it all starts. There are people that argue you could have free verse songs and I don't really think it works. I think you can do that in poetry if you have really good simile and metaphor and imagery, but it really doesn't work once you put rhythm in there, okay? So now, let's talk about exact versus approximate rhyme. When you're doing your assignment to write some basic rhymes, you don't have to rhyme exactly. I could have said, um, I went walking with my dog, but I forgot to put my hat on. On and dog, not really, but in the heat of the moment, in a jam session, when you're singing your lyrics, you, as long as you have the same vowel, the ending consonant doesn't always have to be exact. It can have a similar sound, okay? So a lot of bluegrassers use approximate rhyme. This is something that happens a lot. If you write poems already, okay, these can be songs. Now, I know this is an uncomfortable subject for some who like to pour out their emotions and their poetry, but hey, we're all emo even if we don't admit it. So what we want to do is think, if you do write poems, think about offering one of them up to me at our next lesson, and I will put music to it on the spot. Now, poems are like distilled song lyrics. They're really rich, and there's a lot of density there. So often we have to take out some words and make it lighter and fluffier before it becomes a song lyric. Because um, I do write poems, and I, a lot of them I turn into songs by just taking out some of the words. So if you do write songs, take a note of that. And when we meet again, I would love to show you how to turn those into actual song lyrics, okay? So we're still discussing the quadrant element two of lyrics now. <clears throat> and we are down to things to write about. Now, of course, this could be 10 pages, but I like to break it down into some basic categories of subjects. I notice when I'm listening to a lot of different songwriters, and I do, that they generally are writing about their experiences, okay? Often these aren't good ones. Typical is heartbreak, longing, um, really wanting to be with someone, finally being with that someone and really wishing you weren't with that someone, you know, uh, like that line, the classic John Prine line, like he's so brilliant. How can I miss you if you won't go away? Just like there's so many ways to portray a subject. That's a great example of that. So one of the things I have my, my lyric students do, my song, actual songwriting students, is I have them journal about something they'd like to, to talk about or write about. Um, a dog that died, a, a, a vacation, whatever. It can be as silly and shallow as you can imagine. And then I will turn that into rhyme and then put chords to that rhyme and next thing you know, you've got a folk song. It happens quicker than you'd think. 
One of the main things I'd like to get across in this class today is you really don't need talent to do this. That's kind of a, a kind of a, um, a cult. You know, you need to be talented to do this. No, you need to be able to rhyme cat and hat. And you need to know two chords. Some of the best songs have both chords, as I like to say, and that's all you need. Okay? I've even written a song with one chord so my band could learn it <laughs> and make it easy on them. Now, turning feelings into words under um, section three, subsection two, this is what I call musical alchemy because the real good songwriters can hit you in the chest with their lyrics. They're able to convey an emotion so strongly that it actually like jumps out of them and into your heart. And so how you do that is using some tools that poets use. And one of these is having synonyms. You want to think of other ways to say things. Uh, metaphor is another great thing. If you Google metaphor and just read what Wikipedia has to say on it, and simile is another one. These are tools that good songwriters use so we don't be literal all the time, okay? So as opposed to saying, I'm going down the road feeling bad, we want to think of synonyms for bad. Got the blues, uh, feeling down, um, my head's in a fog. Um, these are all different ways to express a simple word. The more ways you can express one feeling, the better a lyricist you're gonna be. So sometimes I'll sit around and I'll think of a feeling I'm having like, um, it's a nice day, I wish I was not in front of the computer. And then I'll try to put that into how many different ways can I say that? You know, how many ways, you'll say it once and then you'll try to express it in a bunch of different ways. That's how you develop your poetical muscle, okay? Now, another, the last item on page one is actually a really heavy duty concept and I wanna make sure I try to communicate this. When we're writing about something, it's like we have a lens and we're looking through that lens at the subject. As soon as you change lenses or change where you're standing, you have a whole different way of expressing that subject. So how do you approach a subject artistically? Well, first of all, don't approach it from yourself. Think about how someone else might see that. My song about my dog going dookie on the neighbor's lawn, if I wrote through the pen of my neighbor, it would be maybe like this. Why does that guy always let his dog on my lawn? And it will go, we'll just run down that road and see how I can express the dog situation from a neighbor's viewpoint using another person's lens. Dylan was great at this, great at this. Um, Leonard Cohen, great at that. Great, great writers with metaphor and different lenses. Another thing I like people to say is approach it from a completely different standpoint. I have a wonderful student who is writing a song. She wants to write a song about COVID-19. And I said, yes, great. It's a heavy subject. How do you, um, how do you approach this and not bum everybody out you know how do we make it light but not be insincere and we brainstormed and then i said what if you start your first lyric describing all the ridiculous stuff that adults are doing online to try to amuse themselves during quarantine and so she came up with this really great lyric that was hysterically funny about different things she had seen people do, including trying to exercise with bungee cords and almost knocking themselves out. And that's how she started the song. And then she could get deeper and darker as she goes along, but she came in with a nice light entry. The, how, how she did that was going from other people's views and thinking about a completely different way to start the lyric. That's always a great exercise, okay? Also, how about different historical points of view? Another great Dylan trick, you know? Um, the Joker and the Thief, uh, talking about like metaphors from different eras. How about put your situation into 17th century England, you know, and make it that you're a jester in, in the court and uh, you keep winking at the queen and the king wants to have you executed. And it's amazing what you could have a similar metaphor, anything that actually works for me, you can put it under a different era and you have a different way to describe it, okay? So the thing about lyrics is like learning how to swim, you can't do it until you get in the water. So I would like to playfully assign each of you 
to do some rhymes. It doesn't matter how silly they are. And then when we meet again, I'm going to put those to music, which we'll discuss also a little later in the, uh, the class. Um, just because these next subjects are quite dense, I want to just segue right over to page two because I want to ha have time to actually compose for you and show you how you can do it. So page two of our um, uh, syllabus, this carries on with the lyric element of the antidote to being dark and heavy is humor. And that's what I said with her COVID-19 song. My student Sheila started with people's wacky antics on the internet. And it added a funny element to a rather heavy subject, okay? Now, I want you to start what I call your word bag. I have this on my fridge and I have it everywhere. I have post-its all over the, the darn house. Um, what that means is whenever you hear a cool phrase, anything that would make you think that could make a good song title, um, something someone says in line at Safeway, if you can hear them from six feet apart, um, we want to grab those phrases. Those are golden. I call this the um, the word bag. I collect them. Like uh, I had a, a friend, uh, he was talking about his ex and he's like, well, loving her was never easy. I'm like, well, what, doesn't she have any friends you could, you know, uh, ask out? And he's like, well, her, her sister's probably nicer. And I'm like, well, you know, loving her wasn't easy, but her sister probably is. And he's like, what? And I said, that's a song title. And then I came up with, and sorry, this is slightly not PG-13. Loving you ain't easy, but I hear your sister is. And that became the title that became the song. Now, I'm not necessarily saying you have to be inappropriate, but mild inappropriateness actually gets people's attention, okay? Hey, the folk singers were the ultimate rappers way back when. When you listen to like some of the lyrics of old hillbilly music, they would make Tupac blush, okay? They're hardcore, hardcore. Um, plus, you know, then you have barnyard noises, which takes it to a whole different level. So when you're using Huber, remember, that can lighten up any subject. It's like putting vanilla in your coffee. It's really, really wonderful. So your word bag, any cool words you like, um, things people say, song titles, and then subjects also. I want to write the neighbor's dog into a song. Put that down, okay? Because that will remind you when we meet to work on that. Now. Here's another uh, barrier to a lot of potential singer-songwriters, and they think they have to play an instrument well. Once again, you don't. Once again, Bob Dylan. If you got three chords, you've got a songwriter in you, okay? So I play a number of instruments. In fact, lately I've been enjoying ukulele because it's so transportable, and all you need to do is have one finger on deck or two to make most of your chords. And so if you can strum exactly a, a little guitar or the banjo, and we'll talk a bit more about that, you can basically start putting your lyrics to rhythms and chords. And that's when the fun starts. I can't wait to demonstrate that. Now with the banjo, it's a pattern-based instrument. We do a lot of rolls, as y'all pickers know. As a songwriter, I recommend, first of all, taking your right hand and moving it up in the Y position and doing like a simple roll that has repetition with the thumb to give us some bass lines, like a sort of inverted square roll. That strings four, two, three, one. Okay, so take a note of that. That's a great songwriter roll for banjo. And then of course, the frailing as well. So as long as we're not doing a bunch of notes, that's the, that's the one drawback with banjo. If we keep it simple and put the voice and the spotlight, that's the trick with the banjo. So, quadrant element three under section four. The role of your instrument in this class is just to accompany your voice. That's all it is, it's playing backup for your voice. Whether you're talking or whining, or like I do, I just yell at people and make it rhyme. Whatever you're doing with your voice, your instrument is supporting that, okay? So how do we do that? Well, number A, section one, is you have to know your basic chord shapes. Okay, that means how to make those chord shapes with your hand and get there in time to match your lyrics. So I'm gonna share with you a chart and I call this um, the chord family. Some of you might already have this chart um, and basically this shows you that if you're in a key and you pick, like I'm gonna write a song in the key of, let's say I'm gonna write a song in C, okay? Then we're gonna refer to the chord family chart 
This is a great way to think of combining chords together. Let's say we're in the key of C. You have two families of chords, the primaries and the secondaries. If this is the only theory you learn today, it'll last you for a lifetime. So basically, if I'm in C, the number one is the root or the key. And you'll probably all of a sudden realize that yes, when you listen to people play songs in C, F happens all the time and G happens all the time. That's why they're called the primary chords. Ten billion songs go one, four, one, five, and they have numbers, okay? However, if you also know the secondary chords, as a songwriter, you have way more colors to work with. So in the key of C, D minor, A minor, and even E minor also sound really nice. So now we can move around the families of chords and create different chord progressions. And chord progressions is where the magic begins. That's when we string chords together like Legos. So let's say we go one, two, six, five. I'm just picking random orders. One, two, six, five. So C, D minor, A minor, G. It would sound like this. There's the two. Oh, I like it. There's the six. There's the five. Sounds like every indie rock song out there. And yes, that can be your song. Chord progressions can't be patented or copyrighted. There's been big battles over that. <laughs> I think John Fogarty either sued or got sued on a chord progression. But they're public domain, okay? So the idea here is once you have your chord families memorized, then you, you're off and running to write as many chord progressions as you want. Real quick before we move on from the chord families, the numbers refer to where these chords live on the scale. So if in the key of G, let's say we're in G. That means if you want to know what the uh, two is, well, <laughs> G, A, it's the next, no, you count fingers. The numbers are how you count fingers to get the chord. What you need to memorize is which ones are major and which ones are minor, okay? Um, so the idea with this two is you want to be able to put these together in building blocks, okay? Um, and so let's talk about that just for a second. Um, I think that's in another category, but I'm going to tie this in right now. Um, basically, get your, note, get your pens out. We're going to write down a couple of cliches. And basically what that means is things that go to good together, okay? Um, and Josh, I see you submitted 15641. Very nice. Let's write that down, and then I'll explain how to do the chord families with it. One, five, six, four, one, okay? Um, I'm gonna give you one, four, one, five, just because every single human in the universe uses that. I'm gonna give you one, six, two, five. That's like every single 50s song ever written. If you hear this, along oh girl why did you leave? Nah, nah, nah. that's one six two five it happens so much also with jazz music one six two five one six two five i wrote a song using that um having a slightly disappointing experience re recently and i was trying to blame someone i called it blame cupid uh and i put it to that jazzy feel and it worked. We'll talk about style templates here in a bit. How about uh, five? You can start with the five. Four. One. Five, four, one, five. Some people have songs that are circles. And then of course the dreaded wagon wheel. What does that do? Okay, I know I, I brought up wagon wheel. We'll work through this later. Okay, it's going to be one, five, six, four. Basically, you'll see all these songwriters are doing are they're shaking and mixing up different combinations of those chord families. You could literally have like a, a magic eight ball and have chord numbers on it. I bet someone's probably already done that. Otherwise, I just gave the invention away. But you could have some kind of multi-sided dice where you could throw it and it would show you different combinations. You could throw a pencil at a piece of paper. If you mix up and scramble up the chord families in different orders, you're going to get nice chord progressions, and that's another start of a song, okay? So let's talk about adding chords to a melody, because a lot of you 
probably hum or sing even if you don't admit it. Taking a walk with the dog, humming. Um, this is something that it's really important to know how to do. So let's say we have a melody that goes G, 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 F sharp, F sharp, F sharp, E, E, E. And it's really simple. And you, you, but you just like that. Mm, 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 mm. Okay. Well, there's three ways to harmonize a note, and I want you to take a note about this. A note about a note. Let's take this G for example. You can harmonize a note as the root of a chord, the third of a chord, or the fifth of a chord. This is pretty magical. Let me see if I can get this across. If you get this in your head, it's going to really expand how you're going to write your songs because you don't just want to go G, oh, I'll play a G chord. And that's okay, but there's two other options out there. In fact, there's more if you count minors and sevens. What if you asked yourself, what other chord does G occur in? It happened, there's a G note in a C chord. Yeah, it's just the fifth of the chord. So you could also harmonize that G note with a C chord. So if I go la, 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 that's the standard root harmonization. Now I'm gonna harmonize it as the fifth of a C chord. La, 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 la. See how the emotion changes? It's really neat. Listen to how this G has a solid, simple emotion. La, 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 la. Same note. La, 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 la. That could be a great hook right there for a song. You just have one note and you change the chords under it. That G also occurs as the third of an E minor, okay? Now, if you're wondering how I'm getting this, it's because I don't have a life and I just study music theory, but I do have charts that you can actually refer to, so you don't have to memorize all this. But just understand today that as a songwriter, when you have one note, you can have a song with one note. Da -da 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 Your own one note samba. And you could harmonize that with three different sounds, watch. La -la -la -la. with one note it's pretty magical so that's not even counting minors you can harmonize that as a G minor la, 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 la. Oh, that's really spooky that's dark that's the good one for the dog dookieing in the neighbor's yard da, 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 da. I could harmonize it is the is the third of an E flat chord la, 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 la. Ooh, that sounds like a 60s kind of like uplift da, 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 da. and the Beatles would do that a lot they would have dun, they would have like this marching note and have the chords change under it. I think they even do that in Yellow Submarine in the trippier versions. So basically, if, if you just take away today that any time you have a note that you're singing, you can harmonize that note as the root of the chord, the third of the chord, the minor third of the chord even, and the fifth of the chord. There's actually, I lied, there's four common ways to harmonize a note. Now, let's talk about scales. Don't worry, I'm not going to make them boring and wave a ruler around. But most composers are decomposing now, but most modern composers use scales to come up with melodies. Because think about this. If I'm just, once again, in my backyard gardening, if I'm humming or singing, I'm gonna be doing single notes because guess what, our voice can't do chords. We can't do more than one note at a time. It's like a flute or you know, a, um, any of those single note at a time instruments, purely melodic. So what I want you to do is write down a couple of scale families today and then we'll learn to use these. Scale families are major, parentheses, seven note, then major pentatonic, that's P-E-N-T, well, I'm not teaching spelling, never mind. I was going to look bad on the video. <laughs> Major pentatonic, um, meaning five notes. I do know it means it's Greek for five. So it's no longer Greek to you. Um, we have the minor, the natural minor. We have the harmonic minor, parentheses, raised seventh. And we have the pentatonic minor. Okay. Those are your common families of scales that we want to at least learn those. And those of you who've been studying with me for a while are generally are going to be able to play those on your instrument. Then we have a subcategory that are the modes, M-O-D-E-S, 
write that subcategory. And what this means is there are scales other than major and minor, okay? For some reason, in so much of music, everything's polarized. There's major and minor, three, four, 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 happy, sad. It's very binary, okay? Prior to the coalescing of scales into two camps, major and minor, there were these things called modes that date back to like long, 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 long time ago in, in, in Greece and whatnot. And they had names like Mixolydian and Dorian and Aeolian and Phrygian, and they were named after provinces and areas of land where people would play these on their harps, running around with uh, leaves in their hair and eating grapes and whatnot. And my music history is a bit weak right there. But here are some modes I want you to write down. These are some modes that we want to basically get familiar with. And I, the way I teach modes is I don't teach you all of them. Because if you're writing songs based on the Phrygian mode, you might need therapy. <laughs> or you're in a, a Swedish metal band, uh, which is awesome, you know, cavorting with dwarves and wearing black eyeliner. Yes, Joshua, I know. I'm teasing you about your music. But the modes that you want are the Dorian, D-O-R-I-A-N. After Dorian, write this formula. I'm going to give you the actual formula so you can play it on your instrument. And I'll go slow. One, comma, two, comma, flat three. That's a little lowercase b in a three. Comma, four, comma, five, comma, six, comma, flat seven. So those of you who've had some theory with me will recognize right away, that's like a, a natural minor scale where the six has been raised. And so here's the thing. If you want to write a sad song on a minor scale, nah, see, let me do a key I can sing. There's my natural minor scale, the, the main minor scale. Now watch, I'll count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. What happens if I sharp that six? One, two, three, four, five, six. Ooh, six, five, seven, one. Ba, 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 da. All of a sudden, it has a dark flavor, but it's not super dark. Um, tons of bands use the Dorian. A lot of heavy metal, a lot of hard rock uses the Dorian. Um, a lot of Renaissance music is based on the Dorian mode. Um, and the great thing about the Dorian mode, and you make, might want to take a note of this, it's the only minor key that the four chord is major, and that is nuclear in its significance. Here's why. So let's say we're in A minor. That's by one, right? It's by four. dark and sad, dark and sad. Now, if you use the Dorian mode to build your chords from, that will dictate that that four chord has to be a major. Watch how awesome that sounds rising up from the minor key. Here we go. There's the one. Watch what happens when I go to the four. I love the Dorian mode. It's just for that reason. Kind of like folk rock sounds are created from the Dorian mode because you can have your minor song and that sad minor key, but when you go to the four chord, it's going to have that beautiful uplift, okay? Now, we're going to talk about the Mixolydian mode, okay? This is probably the most popular mode of them all. Um, and by the way, I can't think of any bluegrass song that doesn't either accidentally or incidentally go to the Mixolydian at some point. Um, and I want to just real quick, some of you are messaging me, and I do appreciate that. It's hard for me to answer messages while I'm doing this. I'm doing my best. Please note your messages and ask me in your private lesson as well, and we'll cover any theory basics you need to further break down these subjects. When I refer to numbers, all it means is numbers of the scale. So if I say raise six, it means that has to be moved up a fret, and flat it means moved down a fret. That's hillbilly bonics for the theory of intervals. So. Let's talk about the Mixolydian mode, right? Mixolydian mode, and then the formula is one, two, three, four, five, six, flat seven, and then one. Aha, we've taken a major scale and flatted that seventh interval. 
Now the seventh interval is very important because it's the reason songs end on their key. Here's why. That seventh note is so stressful that it just has to resolve back to the key. It can't hang there. There's a story that uh, Johann Sebastian Bach's students would play a trick on him when he would be napping in his study. They'd tiptoe over to the piano and play this much of a major scale. And invariably, Bach would awaken and, and stumble over to the piano and have to play the final note because it was so much tension. He couldn't handle not resolving to the key. So, now that you know the importance of that seventh degree, it ends all of our songs. Watch, here's my song in G. I just have to go back and land. What happens when you flat that extremely important note? Now we have this. It's bluesy, it's kind of mean and... But it's not minor. It's still basically, the scale has a major third. So it's fairly happy, but that flat at seventh gives it a little bit of blues. That's why folk musicians and bluegrass musicians and country musicians and most rock musicians write with that mode, okay? Country and bluegrass musicians do it on purpose, rock musicians do it <laughs> accidentally, but nonetheless, they're arriving at the same place. And here's what it sounds when you harmonize that. Watch this, G. How many songs go? One, to the flat seven, to the four, in your chord cliches. Remember we wrote the numbers down? One flat seven four. Guess what this is? One flat seven two four. D to C to G. Sweet Home Alabama, the most famous one flat seven four song in the world. But the reason we have that flat seven chord is you guessed it because we flatted the seventh of the scale. And remember scales dictate what kind of chords we use. Because scales are built from interval, chords are built from intervals of the scale. Okay? Man, the Mixolydian is awesome. What about old Joe Clark? See, round, uh, what's the key I can do? Round, 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 old Joe Clark. Round, round, I say. Round, round, old Joe Clark. I'm bound away. That's A to G to A, the flat seven, Mixolydian mode. So many songs. So much Celtic music that does that. Um, jigs and reels in Celtic music have that happy major third, but that slightly morose flat seven. Very important mode to write songs with, okay? Um, so we talked about the scales and modes. Item D under section five, I love this, is how you identify song sprouts. Anytime you have an idea for a song, that's what I call a song sprout. And you should collect this and you should record it on your phone and you should jot it down because once you lose a song sprout, they're gone for good. You want to keep these. The song sprouts can enter from any point of the quadrant. They can enter from lyrics. They can enter from music theory and chord progressions. They can enter from playing a riff on your instrument and can, they can enter from singing a melody or humming a tune. Okay. So when you look at that quadrant, be aware that each of those four areas you can start a song with. Okay, so let's talk about song sprouts, the chord progression, right there. If you're sitting around after this class and you're going, wow, one flat seven, the four, and you put a little finger pick into it, you go, that's a song sprout. Granted, 10 billion people have written this song, but so what? All we're really doing is reinventing each other's art when you boil it down. So this will be, here's the D and C to G, okay? So, anytime you come up with a couple of chords that you think sound cool, please recognize you have a song sprout and write that sucker down, because I'm gonna wanna hear about it and we'll put lyrics to it, okay? Uh, number two, song sprout, lyrics, phrases, and titles. So many people get stuck thinking just lyrics. Well, I can't write lyrics, I can't write lyrics. Well, what about, what about your song title that you came up with? Like, um, once again, I'm sorry, mine aren't always PG-13. G 
She was only a moonshiner's daughter, but I loved her still. Okay, so that's just a title I came up with, right? I haven't written the song yet, but you want to keep any little catchy, something you think is funny, any title, song titles often. Some, one day I'll do a, a concert of just song titles. <laughs> Won't be very long show, but it will be amusing as heck. Um, phrases, things people say. Facebook is a gold mine for that. Memes are a gold mine for stealing phrases to write songs. And it's perfectly legal, okay? So these all go in your word bag, keep your, or your notepad, or your notebook, or your imaphone, or whatever, whatever your manemolos are using these days. You want to keep these from disappearing, okay? Then we have hooks. The hook is a really interesting art. Check this out. Instantly, we all know what that is. That's because that's a hook. A hook is a short, extremely catchy melody. Short being very important. What makes it catchy? It's unique. It has a twist. <coughs> For example, smoke on the water. Let's analyze that according to the minor scale it's based on. One, three, four, one, three, flat five, four. They put a flat five note in there. Historically, that's a note that is the most dissonant you can find. And it was even called El Diablos in Musica, the devil's note. And it was, you could get in trouble using it as a composer in the 17th and 18th centuries until modern music made it okay. That's because if, if you take a scale, as a bit of trivia here, and you go from octave to octave, and you cut that octave exactly in half, you get this interval, that scary sounding note, the flat five. Check this out, if I go, When you play the flat five and then the root over and over again, that's what all sirens do, okay? Um, scary historical fact, the uh, the Nazi dive bomber airplanes, the Stuka planes would use that interval as they're charging down to uh, gun people over. Psychology has used this interval to create fear. It's in alarms, it's in uh, sirens, <clears throat> you know? A lot of your banjo players, you've probably heard that a lot. So basically you want to Great hooks, even if you don't like doing it. If you just literally play a chord and go na na na, that's how hooks start. Watch. Na 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 na. Na 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 na. Ooh, I like that. Na 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 na. Na 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 na. And just FYI, I went to a major four there because it sounded Dorian. So that wasn't a very good hook. But I could turn that into a song. Bop, bop, bop. Then you go, you find it, and you record that sucker immediately, okay? So you could actually do a study, and I think this might be a fun class sometime, is collect all the famous hooks, okay? There's complicated hooks too, like this. That's still a hook. It's a long hook, but it's a hook, okay? But more popular hooks would be like, uh, Oh. Some of you probably uh, are old like me and remember that. And of course, modern hip hoppers like to sample hooks and use them to rap over. So that's why some of these are, have some, some new life. That was Michael Jackson. Great hook. Great hook. It's so catchy. The problem is some of you will probably be brushing your teeth to that later today. A good hook sticks with you. You'll be typing to it, okay? <laughs> I'm, I apologize now for that. <clears throat> um, subjects under uh, section four under five, <clears throat> something you want to get off your chest. We talked about that earlier. If you have a subject you want to write about, I don't care how banal or shallow it may seem, write that down, okay? And then we'll expound upon that lyrically next time. Um, Basically, it's a skill that you'll develop. Okay, now we're in item six, seven, and eight. We're closing in to the discussion part of the class. Keeping it, writing versus recording. In the olden days, back when cars had horses full of them, people had to write everything down, okay? Now we have cellophones. So anytime you come up with anything, speak the lyric, strum it, record that on your device. 
please. Because I guarantee you, if you show it to me at our next lesson, I'll make a song out of it. It might not be a song we like, but I'll show you how that's done, okay? So you can write it down. You can, I, I tab stuff out. If you have tab paper, you can tab it out too. You don't have to use notation. But the main thing is you want to write it or record it, and I recommend recording. I have so many song sprouts on my phone. It's probably going to blow up. Um, so let's talk about what I call the instant song game. Um, let's see. Joshua, text me a, a subject for a song. The Devil's Tritone, is that the subject? Okay. I like that. We'll, we'll make that the subject because that's challenging. First, you grab your, your notepad and you rhyme with tritone. Alone, phone, moan, groan. Uh, and you, you get a collection of, of words, okay? Now I'm going to choose a mode. I'm going to choose the Dorian. It has that nice major four. Sometimes when I'm sitting here alone. up the phone. I want to write a song. I won't make it very long, but I guarantee you I'll use the devil's tritone. Okay, now that was cheese ball, but you see what I did there? One of the elements of good rhyming is you save your rhyme. You don't do it and then rhyme with it. You set up your word by rhyming ahead of it, okay? There's endless tricks with rhyme, but the idea is any phrase, that was Devil's Tritone, two phrases. I'm gonna do more examples of that in our own lessons because I wanna inspire you, some of you to try your hand at this songwriting hobby. You'll surprise yourself. It happens before you know it, okay? Um, and there's some examples um, of my songs that I put on my Facebook page that uh, I, I use. For example, I'll just do a quick demo of I wanted to write a song about how, you know how people say we're all in the same boat with this whole thing happening, or at least we're in the same ocean, different boats, mine has holes in it, but we want to be able to use metaphor. So I thought, how many ways can we say we're in the same boat? Peas in a pod. I want to be hillbilly, okay? But I want to start with humor. I like Barnes and Noble and self-help books. Sometimes I cry in the store and I get funny looks, but I don't mind. Cause all those books that I'd buy, they cost too much, so it's cheaper to cry in the store. And what's more, when I look around at all the people there, nobody making a sound. It's like a TV show or a real bad dream. I just want to shake them. I just want to scream and say we're all just peas in a broken pod. We're still trying to pray to a deadbeat God and I can forgive. You can forget, cause I think this is as good as it gets. We're a natural disaster. The cats meow, we're drinking chocolate milk from sacred cows. Oh, geez. Yeah, we're all just peas. Now that's silly, but I wanted to approach the subject with silliness. Okay? And I want to conclude this class with the importance of silliness. Silliness is the antidote to being nervous, to being a perfectionist to taking yourself too seriously, and to try to um, worry about what other people think. Because if I'm being silly, if someone doesn't like that song, guess what, I'm joking. I don't really mean that. That's one big rhyme joke. I don't have to commit to it. I can bail out and say I didn't really mean it. So if you, the sillier you can make your test rhymes, the better. Trust me, you'll wanna be silly when you start this stuff. If some of you are writing dark poetry about, you know, the depth of your, of your pain, then that's great. Continue to channel that. Because if you don't, you'll end up in therapy like me. But if you're silly about it, then you'll be able to share it with me and it won't feel like pulling hen's teeth, okay? So our assignment for this class, should you choose to accept it, is gonna be very simple. You're gonna rhyme a couple words like ball and hall or cat and hat, okay? Um, and Joshua, by the way, uh, wrestling is a very hard word to rhyme. I sh should let you know. Um, so we want to rhyme a couple of words. Everyone's going to be bugging me about that later. What did he say? So we want to rhyme a couple of words and make it silly and make it playful. And here's the deal I will make for you. At our next lesson, I'll see most of, most of you next week or the week after, we're going to make an instant song about it, okay? And feel free to text me your, your rhymes, email me your rhymes. Like I've said before, um, 
I'm kind of a getting stir crazy and I love to hear from all of you. And I want to thank you so much for coming to my group today. I hope it's been illuminating. Um, this will be up on YouTube later. And also on the 25th of May, I'm doing another workshop on Saturday on the art of accompaniment, of how to play backup, which ties into this because I'll give you lots of tricks on how to play backup for your own voice when you're becoming a singer-songwriter. Okay? And the world needs you now. We need singer-songwriters. We need poets. We need people talking about fun, happy stuff to cheer us all up. Okay? So we're leading the charge here. Thank you so much for coming to my class. Have a wonderful weekend, and I'll hear from most of you very soon. Have a great Saturday. To find out about upcoming workshops, click on the events page at jamalong.org, and you will see all of our upcoming classes. I like Barnes and Noble and self-help books. Sometimes I cry in the store and I get funny looks, but I don't mind.